I bid you all good morning, good evening, and good night, wherever you'll be watching this transmission. Tomorrow is Tuesday. It's still Monday where I'm at, but Tuesday, markets open, fresh, and ready to go, and something big is happening tomorrow in the markets. So I kind of want to put this up a day before because this is something that investors and anyone that's anybody that's been following the markets since this uneasiness uh, need to take a look at tomorrow because this is going to be the day of days and I reckon it's going to see a lot of changes and there's going to be a lot of side effects to this. And what am I talking about? Right here. Better Dwelling threw up an article and it's really well written, really well explained. Okay, guys? Uh, Fed will start buying bond ETFs on Tuesday. BlackRock to make $15 million in fees. So Zero Hedge wants to overemphasize that, hey, these guys at BlackRock are making $15 million in fees for just hanging out and just kind of, I guess, being there for you know, to push a button or something. But I'm looking more at this, this what's happening here with these uh, bond ETFs that the Fed will start buying. Now, there's a really well-written article, so I'm going to take my time with this, guys. Let's go to Article Scan. And I'm looking forward to reading your comments on this one because this throws you, this throws everything that we were taught basically into the garbage in Business 101 and when you learned uh, bonds and understanding ETFs and understanding trading mechanisms and pretty much going against any regulation that was put out there to protect the common person. So let's take a look at this. Uh, last Monday, in response, Goldatch tweet, I don't know if you guys know him, but he's the king of bonds. Here we go. In which... The Bond King said, I am told the Fed has not actually bought any corporate bonds via the shell company set up to circumvent the restrictions of the Federal Reserve Act of 1913. I don't know how many laws were just broken there, but I'm very sure that if the common citizen um, opened and set up a um, shell company to circumvent restrictions... <laughs> Of the Federal Reserve Act, I think the average person will be in a lot of trouble for, I don't know how many laws are broken there. The New York Fed announced on its website that it expects to begin purchasing eligible ETFs, most notably LQD and JNK, as part of the emergency lending program in early May. Now, bond ETF, this is, this is the key part right here. Bond ETFs are passively managed and trade, much like stock ETFs. On major stock exchanges, this helps promote market stability by adding liquidity, which there's been a lack of, and transparency during times of stress. Again, a keyword, uh, stress, support word, uh, transparency. So this is a big, big section right here. Key takeaways. Bond ETFs are exchange traded funds that investment in various fixed incomes, securities such as corporate bonds or treasuries, T-bills. Bond ETFs allow ordinary investors to gain passive exposure to benchmark bond uh, uh, bond in, in indices in an inexpensive way. But, but the problem with this is you could be invested in a lot more. Okay, investors should understand the risks to bond ETFs include the effect of interest interest rate changes. So now... Better Dwelling put this together and actually showed the interest rate change to zero. Now, I'm kind of hedging on this because it looks like it's going to go negative and they're pushing to negative rates. And if you're if you're new to my channel, welcome. And here it is. Negative rates all the way in deposit accounts in Germany. Let the negative rates begin. That's a year ago. Negative rates in bail-ins down under in Australia. Can banks handle negative rates? I've been doing, like, could you get used to negative race or uh, a negative interest? So this is something that I've been covering here on the channel for many, many, many years, right? So let's go back here to this. Now, this is the Bond King Jeffrey here. And he tweeted here on his um, Twitter. Sorry, guys, I don't have a Twitter account. That's, like, for, like, very famous people. So I, I, I don't think nobody would even follow me on that. So... Okay, here it is. Jeffrey says, um, these, trillion tr these trillions Treasury is borrowing in heavily in T-bills. Chair Powell has stated in plain English he is opposed to negative interest rates. Now, Powell, if anyone knows, is more of a, an investment banker 
than a someone who's that he's more of an investment banker. He's not more of a regular like you got when you're when you're in the feds or you're working in the feds or the Federal Reserve, you gotta kind of have to go through regulations and do things. You know, when you're more of an investment banker and looking at different angles of it, it sometimes becomes dangerous and it becomes like rolling the dice at the casino. So he says, yet the pressure to go negative on Fed funds will build as short-term borrowing explodes and dominates. Please know rates zero equals fatal. Okay. Again, so he goes in uh, a few days back. So half a week ago, he says, long-term treasury yields are rising. Understandably, due to the $4 trillion growth in national debt coming in just a few months, the Fed has uh, manipulated investment grade corporate bond yields to below 3%. They will certainly want to lower the ceiling for treasury yields again. So that's huge, huge words here by Jeffrey Gundlach. So let's move on to here. So... What's the 1913? Uh, so why are the feds um, basically setting up a shell company? Well, let's find out. 1930, 1913 Federal Reserve Act passed by President Woodrow Wilson just after the World War II during Christmas time while all the congressmen were basically on um, Christmas with their families. 1930-13 Federal Reserve Act is uh, is a U.S. legislation that created the current Federal Reserve System. Cong Congress developed the Federal Reserve Act to establish economic stability in the United States by introducing a central bank to oversee monetary policy. Now, before the Federal Reserve Act was in place, I'm not speaking in favor of the Federal Reserve Act, but a lot of banks w did go bankrupt because they had a really tough time uh, keeping up or kind of staying with policy. So the Federal Reserve Act came into play to help balance or create a monetary system that could bounce. But again, you get into all this and how the Federal Reserve is not American-owned. They're lending money at interest to the people of the country. So they're paying interest on their own debt. It, it's crazy, right? So when you get into it, it's not even, the building isn't even part of the United States. It's There's just all kinds of stuff that's happening with it. Um, I understand it, the system and why they threw it in, but t taking everybody off the gold reserve was one of the biggest mistakes they made, right? And this started right here. This is when things started. To, to create regulation to submit to more deregulation. So the rules go into place, the money gets divided, right? And then deregulation starts to happen upon request or of when needed because not one bank is on the hook. It's basically the Federal Reserve that's on the hook, right? So it's kind of weird to, to kind of explain like, I understand the Fed is not part of the territory it's on. It's not even American. Uh, you know, it, it prints off money full blast and to pay off its debts. There's no longer anything. There's no intrinsic value in the money it creates. And yeah. So the 1913 Federal Reserve Act created the Federal Reserve System known simply as the Fed. It was implemented to establish economic stability in the U.S. by introducing a central bank to oversee monetary policy. A lot of banks before the Fed from when Andrew Jackson destroyed the bank uh, in his presidency and got rid of the banking system, a lot of private banks would fold and go bankrupt. And that was a huge problem, right? And a lot of people will lose their money and their money wasn't insured, right? The Federal Reserve Act is one of the most influential laws shaping the U.S. financial system. So, so here it is. Here it is. Uh, before 1913, financial panics were common occurrences because investors were unsure of the safety of their bank deposits. Uh, private financiers such as J.P. Morgan, who bailed out the federal government in 1895, often provided lines of credit to provide stability in the financial sector. So there was an un... You know what it is? It's picture a lot of crooked two banks. Picture crooked banks too, right? So if the Federal Reserve is crooked, let's say, okay, but then picture a whole pile of them. 
So you wouldn't even know where to put, you know, back, you know, back, you know, that's, it's the transparency. There was not, there was a lot of shadow thing, shadowing going on, but the Federal Reserve now isn't helping out anything. And they're not minting currency anymore. They're printing currency. And that's the problem that uh, is happening right now. So let's go back here. So, so uh, until today, the Fed announced in late the day, late in the day that the facility designed to purchase eligible corporate debt from investors will launch on the May 12th, bringing, which is tomorrow, bringing the most controversial part of the U.S. Central Bank's emergency Kovi lending program. Again, they're blaming it on the big C, right? One which not even Burmark, uh, uh, sorry, Bernanek dared to activate at the depths of the financial crisis, perhaps realizing that there would be no extraction from that particular moral hazard. Online following weeks of anticipation. The Fed secondary market corporate credit facility will begin purchases of exchange trade funds, e ETFs, uh, on May 12, the New York Fed website said nearly two months after it was first announced in late March and served a key role in keeping the financial markets relatively calm since then. So here it is, uh, as specified in the term sheet, which is down here below, I'll show you in a second. The SMCCF may purchase U.S. listed ETFs whose investment objective is to provide a uh, broad exposure to the market uh, for the United States corporate bonds. The penderendents of the ETF holdings, pre preponderance, so they've been holding basically, holding back on ETF holdings, would be ETFs whose primary investment objective is exposure to the, to the U.S. Investment grade corporate bonds and the remainder will be in an ETF's whose primary investment objective is exposure to U.S. high-yield corporate bonds. The SMCCF will consider several additional factors in determining which ETFs will be eligible for purchase. Those considerations include the composition of investment-grade and non-investment-grade rated debt and the management style, the amount of debt held in depository in institutions. Good luck with that. And the average tenor of the underlying debt, the total assessed uh, assessed uh, under management, and the average daily trading volume and leverage, if any. Yeah, if any. So here it is. Uh, these are the ETFs that will be eligible for Fed purchases. Um, here it is, guys. So allocated uh, 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 corporates, and here it is in percentage-wise. And then there's the ticker sign. And then here you have your uh, IU... AUM is, let's back to basics here, guys. AUM is assets under management. Assets under management is the total market value of an investment that a person or entity uh, manages on behalf of clients. Assets under management definitions and, f and formulas vary by company. So there is assets under management and your total return, and lots of it sitting at negative territory right here. So there it is there, and there is the benchmark index right here. Now, so this is part is very, very important right here. So uh, uh, the key points right here, the, I got this little thing in my way here. I'm trying to, okay, here we go. Uh, uh, it would front run the Fed's bond purchases. Now here's the key, layering conflicts of interest upon conflicts of interest but who cares anymore big deal corporate debt buying included etfs will occur in these stages occurring to the agreement stabilization phase and ongoing monitoring phase and reduction in support phase purchases will be focused on reducing the broad-based deterioration of liquidity seen in march 2020 to levels that correspond more closely to prevailing economic conditions. <laughs> the document said it listed an array of metrics that would guide investments, including transaction costs, bid-ask spreads, credit spreads, volatility, and quali qualitativity market color. Qualitative market color. Sorry, guys. Once market 
uh, functioning measures return to levels that are more closely but not fully aligned with levels that correspond to prevailing economic conditions. Uh, Broad-based purchases will continue at reduced steady pace to maintain these conditions. So what they're doing is they're hedging against that things are going to get better over time. Okay, so here it is. So there's the program management fees. So this goes from June. Okay, so it goes... There's the breakdown in there for fees. So there's the fees right here that BlackRock's was at 15 million bucks. Uh, so there's the fees. What are the fees up here? It says right here. Yeah, 15 million in fees they're collecting. So don't care too much about this. I kind of want to go down to here. Now, this is the annualized basis points, okay, for January 1st, ending January 1st, 2022. So this is a big deal. So you see it go down here from 2.50 basis points annualized for the first, was it 10 billion? That's million. Yeah, 10 billion in average total program management. Okay. AUM. Okay. AUM, assets under management. So keep that in mind. Then it goes down to two basis points. Okay. So this is for calendar year quarter uh, ending before January 1st, 2022. So it starts to go down and it gets to a point where it's going to be at zero basis points, no fee, annualized for the average incremental total asset management, okay? Greater than 250, what is that, billion? Yeah, it's billion dollars there. So this is pushing, what you're seeing here is you're starting to see rates go into negative territory. Now, the dangers of rates going into negative territories is it's good for some corporations to buy rates at a negative territory because it allows you to expense on any capital gains. A lot of people tell me, Mike, but like there's some, some countries in Europe that are doing like negative rates on a lot of things. Who's buying this stuff? Well, again, a lot of big corporate companies buy a lot of these um bonds at a negative uh, yield so they could expense them against their capital gains. So it's kind of like doing the government a favor in a way by buying negative yielding bonds, right? So let's move on to here. Okay, so these are, these are the policy tools. Now let's go back here. There it is here. There's one thing I wanted to open for you guys. That I want, I want to get to a big point here in this in this video here. I want to find that link. There's a link to a 69 page. Uh, here he is. 66 page is right here. Okay, so I went through the 66 page document, and on page 29, this is what's concerning me. On page 21, article article scan, please. Okay, on page 29. Um, in uh, not uh, section nineteen, part two, it says, in connection with in connection with purchasing or sell or selling eligible investments for the company, that the company is a qualified institutional buyer, as defined in Rule one forty four a under the Securities Act of nineteen thirty three. So we're going to go back to that Securities Act one forty four a. Now it's all fine and dandy when you read it. Um. Where's the takeaways? Here are the takeaways. And I'm going to show you what's concerning me about this. Rule 144A modifies SEC restrictions. So privately placed securities can be traded among qualified institutional buyers with much shorter holding periods on uh, and no SEC registration in place. So it's not really regulated. That it like it's not regulated properly like it should be regulated in a way, but you could also hold it for six months. It could be a six month term. It could be like these weird terms, okay? Instead of being your usual two in one year. Okay, the idea is that sophisticated institutional investors don't need the same levels of information and protection that individuals require. Okay, then it goes into say, uh, critics have noted that the lack of transparency and unclear definitions of what constitute as qualify as an institutional buyer. That's a red flag right there. Uh, transparency and unclear definition of what constitutes as a qualified institutional buyer. That's a red flag. But hold on. This is it right here. 
Concerns endure that Rule 144A may give unscrupulous overseas company undue access to the U.S. market without SEC scrutiny. That is a big problem right there, guys. So I read through this, and a lot of this is your law, typical legal jargon and just kind of what companies and agreements, validations, uh, provisions, term provisions, um, foreign assets, everything you need to kind of, kind of, it, it's, it's, it's not as complicated as Canada's tax system. Understanding Canada's tax system, good luck. This is easier to figure out. But when I get to the 192E, 192 section E, and I go here, and then, and then now let's go to Rule 144A holding requirements. Okay. In addition to not requiring that securities receive an SEC uh, registration, Rule 144A relaxed the regulations, let's say deregulated the regulations, over how long a security must be held for. It could be traded. Rather than the customary two-year holding period and a maximum six-month period applies to a uh, to a reporting company, and the minimum one-year period applies to issuers not required to meet reporting requirements. These periods be, uh, begin on the day of securities question were bought and considered paid in full. So here it is, guys. My main concern is right here. Concerns... Uh, Endure that Rule 144 may give unscrupulous overseas companies undue access to the U.S. markets without SEC security scrutiny. Can some country or some entity up there buy up the country? Is it possible? We saw what happens to the Canadian-Australian housing market, New Zealand housing market. So here it is. The sticking point is holding back the Fed from hoovering up corporate debt. Fed has yet to offer details on how business will prove uh, they are el eligible for central bank's corporate bond buying program. This is from a few days back, and this has been sticking for a long time, and here it is. Moreover, if the Fed bought bonds based on the principle of first come, first serve, companies desperate for cash and those re residing in industries dev devastated by lockdowns would rush to certify themselves ahead of companies with more resilient finances, potentially exposing the central bank to more credit risk than it needed to take. The best solution is just drop this requirement. That's what I'm hoping for. So this is um, not enough clarity what's going on. And here it is. What are the risks of investing investing in treasure bonds? Like we all know this, it's basically your little coupon, but you could do a lot better in other um, other um, fields in investing bonds. I've been I've stayed away from the bond market most of my life. Uh, corporate bonds. What is a corporate bond? A corporate bond is a type of debt secured that is issued by a firm sold to investors. The company gets capital it needs to in return. The investor is paid a pre-established number of interest payments at either a fixed or variable interest rate. When the bond expires and reaches maturity, the payment ceases and the original investment is returned. So this is it, guys. This is um, this is going to be a this is going to be, I think, uh, especially. With the way this is laid out right here, see if it opens. There it is. The way this is laid out right here, if you see this, and they're basically easing it in, and eventually it will get to, um, the rates would go to nothing eventually. Here it is. Zero to 2.50. And there's the calendar ending before January 1st, 2022. This 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 will fail in six months. This this will I don't think this 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 will last six months. I don't think it'll, it'll even make it to 2021. Unless there's some sort of entity or an entity we do not know because of the 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 way it's being heavily deregulated um and the way they're 
um, creating a corporate shell to circumvent restrictions, that's kind of giving you an indication that this might be very dangerous, to be honest with you. And I'm just afraid of the taxpayer on his porch with the flaming poop bag holding it. Well, the kid, well, well, the kid, the uh, paper boy, uh, uh, rides away laughing with his friends on their bikes. That's what I feel is going to happen here because, you know, it's 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 this is very dangerous, uncharted waters. Uh, the the feds are going into right now. Yes, I understand that. You know, the 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 the. the Government bonds and stuff are always a sure thing because the government never, def the American government never has defaulted on any debts. So I got a lot of investors telling me that, saying, Mike, you know what? Uh, uh, bonds are a sure thing because, you know, how many times have you seen the, the feds default on any debt? Well, you know, they've been you know, in AAA right now, but what's going to happen when they, when, when they, they, they overprint and, and they're going to have to, this is, again, it goes back to forcing in negative rates and, this is what I'm afraid of, right? And all this deregulation and pulling these uh, side jobs, you know? Pulling in a side job on the side to try and fix something on the side and not being forefront and nothing's really properly disclosed, right? So I look forward to um, your comments below and what do you guys think? I mean, I know it's going to be a lot of negativity, but shouldn't these a lot of these companies, you know, re restart? Shouldn't these a lot of these companies start over? Shouldn't a lot of these companies throw in the towel? Shouldn't a lot of these? I mean, is it is it always going to have to be hinged on the uh, the average pensioner has to pay for it? The average taxpayer? The average, you know, nine to fiver, the average Joe Donuts. Anyways, I've been talking too much. Let me know what you guys think in the comments below. This is starting tomorrow. So let's take a look at what happens and we'll look at the hazards and we'll look at uh, what's going to happen uh, if we start seeing deterioration or the kicking down, kicking the can down the road for another till 2022. Or we're going to see instant deterioration. Or we're going to wait six months. I'm giving it six months. Project seems good, but the, the, the transparency isn't there. So I'm, I'm, I'm just concerned about that. Anyways, guys, let me know what you guys think in the comments below. Thanks for watching, and we'll talk soon. Thank you.